Good morning everybody and welcome to Billingshurst Family Church online service. This morning we're going to have a time of worship led by Liz, one of our le worship leaders, and then we're going to go over to Craig who's going to preach to us from the Word. But before we begin, let me just pray. Father God, thank you that we can join together virtually like this. I pray that you would be with us in this time of worship now, that you would help us to engage, you would stir our hearts and you would speak to us as we worship together. Amen. Over to Liz. Good morning. Let's just start by praying. Lord, I thank you that we can come and worship you. Lord, I thank you that um, regardless of um, what's going on, um, that actually we can still choose to come and worship you and spend time in your presence. Lord, I pray that you would speak to us. Father, that you would use um, this time of worship to... Um, to refresh us, to draw us closer to you, to fix our eyes on you. Lord, I thank you that you are such an awesome God and so worthy of praise. Amen.
Yeah, Lord, we do adore you. We want to come and um, and rest in your presence, Father. I wanted to read something. In Psalm 103, um, it's a psalm of David, and it says, Let all that I am praise the Lord. With my whole heart I will praise his holy name. Let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things he does for me. He forgives all my sins and heals all my diseases. He redeems me from death and crowns me with love and tender mercies. He fills my life with good things. My youth is renewed like the eagles. And later on it says, um, as far He has removed our sin as far from us as the east is from the west. The Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. For he knows how weak we are. He remembers we are only dust. Lord, I thank you that you know us inside out. And um, 
yeah, Lord, I thank you that we can come and worship you. You are such an awesome God, and it is such a privilege to be able to come and spend time in your presence. Touch 
Thank you, Liz. It's great to spend time together in worship, even if it's not quite what we're used to. Now, Craig, our lead elder, is going to speak to us from the Word. But before he begins, let me just pray. Father God, I pray that you would be with us again as Craig speaks, Lord God. I pray that you would open up your Word to us, that we would um, hear what you might be saying to us, what you might be challenging us to change or to do differently, Lord God. And I pray that our lives would be changed as a result of this message. Father God, I pray that you would be with Craig as he speaks. Amen. Over to Craig. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Billingshurst Family Church live stream. My name's Craig. I'm the lead elder at Billingshurst Family Church. And it's great to know that you are joining us this morning. We're in the midst of an international pandemic. The UK has one of the highest numbers of excess deaths per million people compared to most European countries and the US. 
According to a new scientist article published this week on Tuesday, the 12th of January, up until November last year, there were an extra 91,000 deaths in the UK compared to the previous five years. I'm no statistician, but many of us will find those numbers scary. How have you found the news these past few weeks? Perhaps, like some I know, you've avoided the news at all costs, just content to get on with what you can handle rather than to deal with the fear that might be induced by watching. And that is completely understandable, given all that's going on. Perhaps you started watching the new TV show that's all the, all the rage at the moment. Everyone's raving about it called America. Um, maybe just finding out what's going on in the States is enough to distract from what's going on outside our own front doors. Perhaps as you walk around the streets where you live and you see people without masks on, you find yourself fearful and worried about this virus, this illness. I've heard stories of people getting aggressive when they're challenged by frail old ladies for doing, uh, for not wearing masks in shops. Perhaps even the fear of repercussions for doing the right thing is paralysing us right now. There are so many reasons to be fearful in this season. So why do we struggle with fear? Well, fear is a basic primal emotion. It's our response to something that we perceive to be a threat to us. And there are rational and irrational fears. If you're in a rickety old boat uh, and there's water coming in over the sides, maybe there's a hole in it somewhere, and you're in the middle of an Atlantic storm, it is completely rational to have a fear of drowning. It's irrational to have a fear of drowning that prevents you from having a shower in your own home on the, on the first floor. Um, fear is an emotion that can paralyse us. In the Bible, it speaks of people being seized by fear. Fear can restrain people from doing what they need to do. Fear is encompassing. It grabs hold of us. It takes our attention. Fear demands our attention. And yet, fear is helpful. If you stand in front of an angry bear, fear pushes you to react, your body to react, allows adrenaline to, fr to flow, enables you to outrun your, outrun your friend or to stand and fight. Fear isn't particularly evil in and of itself. In fact, there are right things to fear, but in certain situations, fear stops us from doing that which is important, that which is necessary. We'll come to it in a bit as to the right type of fear that there is to have. This week, we're in our Return of the Exiles series in chapter six and the early part of chapter seven of the book of Nehemiah. The walls have been completed. All that's left is to hang the gates. Nehemiah had rallied the people to rebuild the walls. It had only taken 50 or so days from when they started, which is an amazing turnaround of work. In my message today, we finally encounter the 52nd day since they started the work on the walls. The doors were hung and the city was once again secure. As we might expect, having gone through this series for a little while now, that the enemies of the people of God kept fighting to prevent the completion of the walls right to the bitter end. You might remember these names from when Peter preached a couple of months ago, but Sambalat, Tobiah and Geshen are yet again up to their old tricks of trying to stop the work that God had called Nehemiah to oversee. They've worked out that if they can stop the leader of the work, then the whole project just might come to a halt uh, and the city would be back as it was, defenceless, an opportunity to exploit those riches within. They knew that this was their last chance because there was no breach in the wall. There was only amongst the most fortified and well-guarded sections left that were vulnerable, the gatehouses. Charging to attack at these points would be far more dangerous than just climbing over tumbled down walls as it had been before Nehemiah arrived. Yet open gates still presented an opportunity to those who would use the downfall of a nation to their own ends. So Sanballat and Geshem sent messengers to Nehemiah, much as they had before, encouraging him to come, come and meet us. It will be great. Come and see us uh, about 25 miles away from the city on the plain of Ono. You see, they were trying to drag him away from the work. Remove the leader and you remove the vision and the drive. Perhaps the city would fall again if only they could draw him away. But Nehemiah was wise. He fathomed out their plan. He knew that they wanted to harm him, probably kill him. Anything to do what they needed to do to stop the city walls being completed. 
Nehemiah refused and he says this great line, I'm doing a great work and I can't come down. Why should the work stop while, while I leave it and come down to you? It's from Nehemiah chapter 6 verse 3. Four times they ask him, four times he refuses. Nehemiah's eyes are not for being distracted. He has a job to do, a task that he's called to. He won't let his enemies distract him from what is important. Sambalat sends his servant a fifth time with an open letter, open for all to see, a letter filled with rumours and lies. It says words to this effect. Everyone saying it, including my mate Geshem, that you're all going to rebel against the empire, that that's the real reason you're rebuilding this wall. And not just that, you're going to make yourself king and stand against the Persian Empire. You see, these guys are scared and they're doing all they can to stop the work. They're resorting to lies, saying that Nehemiah is getting people to say prophecies that God wants him to be king. We have to remember that Nehemiah was cupbearer to the king, to the Persian king. He knew him personally. If it had been true about Nehemiah's intentions, if it got back to the king that he wanted to make himself king and ruler of this, this city, you can rest assured, I think, that the, the might of the Persian army would have come against Jerusalem. Sambalat, Tobiah and Geshem were threatening Nehemiah. They're trying to make him scared, trying to make him fearful, trying to stop the work. But Nehemiah knows their plans. He can see them. He's not taken in by them. He knows his enemies. He responds to their lies with truth. He tells them that these things aren't true. You're inventing them yourselves. You're making them up in your own minds. Nehemiah knows the tactic of his enemy is to draw him and the people into fear, to paralyse them, to stop them working. He speaks the truth and he draws near to God in prayer. He says, but now, oh God, strengthen my hands. Nehemiah counters lies created to cause fear and paralysis with the truth. And by drawing near to God in prayer, calling on God's strength rather than his own. When we face an enemy who loves to lie and to accuse, let's be those whose haven is found in the truth and in the strength that God gives. Let's hold on to both those things in faith. Now, Tobiah hasn't reared his head for a little bit. So far in chapter six, it's all been about Sambalat and Geshem. Um, and what's Tobiah been up to? Well, it seems like Tobiah has some allies in the city. And a man called Shemaiah, possibly someone important who Nehemiah, be, Nehemiah might be known to listen to, Tobiah pays him off. Tobiah reached out to one of Nehemiah's own, his own, his own you know, brothers, his own kin, um, a Jew just like Nehemiah. He reaches out to this guy and hires him to stop Nehemiah continuing the work. They paid him to get Nehemiah to hide in the temple, to draw Nehemiah again away from the work and into hiding. Nehemiah knows that his God has a plan. And that plan involves Nehemiah being faithful to the call that God has put upon him. Nehemiah refuses to get distracted. He refuses to stop the work for even a moment. And he refuses to run and hide when people are threatening him. He doesn't give in to fear, but instead recognises the truth of the situation, that this man is trying to stop the work. He's trying to distract him. He discerns that the words of Nehemiah aren't from God, even though he might have seemed like a friend. Nehemiah again clings to truth, discerns Shemaiah, Tobiah and Sambalat's intentions and turns to God, not himself taking vengeance, but handing vengeance to God. Rather than holding on to vengeance and resentment, he prays, remember Tobiah and Sambalat, O oh my God, according to these things that they did, and also the prophetess Noadiah and the rest of the prophets who wanted to make me afraid. Yet again, lies and treachery are used to try and incite fear in a man walking in the paths that God has ordained for him to walk. Nehemiah remains strong because he finds his strength in God's plans and purposes, this time handing the behaviour of these people to God and carrying on with the work. As he prays, he lets go of any sense of vengeance, instead choosing to remain faithful to God's plan rather than waste his time dealing with those who seek to stand in the way of God's plan. When people stand against us, when they throw lies our way, when they try to get those close to us on their side, 
Do we respond seeking vengeance? Maybe we want to sometimes, but instead, could we trust in the plans and purposes of God? Remembering that there is a work that God has called us to, a work that's yet incomplete. Let us not distract our eyes with foolish arguments, but instead set them on the work that the Lord sets ahead of us. Why? Because victory is coming. The work will be complete. For us, Jesus will return. The one who went to the cross on our behalf. He's coming back and we keep pushing on uh, to seek that day, to see uh, the gospel go out to as many people as possible before that day comes. That's our call. That's, that's our job as a church, is to, to go out and share the gospel with people. And one day Jesus returns and victory is coming. Uh, just like we're about to see for Nehemiah, victory came. On the 52nd day, since the work on the wall began, the project was complete. This project that seemed impossible, particularly given the time frame, had finally been finished. The tables were turned. Those who sought to incite fear now lived in fear. Not because of aggression, not because Nehemiah declares himself king, but because it's clear that the Lord had helped them to accomplish this work, this great work. We think so often that we need to get even with those who've done us wrong, but even getting even is a distraction for us. When we complete the task given to us, that's our testimony. Not getting even, doing the work that God's called us to, that's our testimony, that's our story. Because when people see God at work in us and what we're doing, it speaks volumes. Once the work's complete, it comes to light that many of the richest in the land of Judah sent letters to Tobiah. The guy who paid Shemaiah to distract Nehemiah. And I find it funny how the Jewish nobles were the ones who didn't have faith for the work. Instead having an allegiance with this outsider, this Ammonite honouring an oath due to his marriage to a Jewish woman rather than God's man who was leading the people in faith. They showed that their allegiance wasn't wholly tied to God, but instead their eyes were distracted away from God and onto things of the world. Exactly what got Israel into this mess in the first place. The nobles sized up to Nehemiah. they trying to tell him how great Tobiah is. Oh, he's not that bad. He's all right. He's a good guy. But still, Tobiah continued trying to make Nehemiah afraid. He kept sending him letters, telling, you know, trying to make Nehemiah scared. But at this point, the work's been completed. God's moved mightily and enabled this work. Tobiah was acting out of spite, anger, at, at losing out, at missing, at getting it wrong. When people see the accomplishment of God, in someone else's life, sometimes all they can do is try to tear that person down for the sheer pleasure of it or for some sick sense of vengeance. Let's just keep the task before us in hand. Let's keep our eyes set on the job that God's given us to do and let God deal with those who seek vengeance. Sometimes we just have to let angry people be angry people and get on with what God's called us to do. Once the work was complete, Nehemiah just brings this great amount of wisdom into the situation. He doesn't leave it just at the work being done, but he, he sets about putting the right people in place to lead and to protect the city. Let's look at who he chose. He chose his own brother, someone we would think we could think that uh, he could trust implicitly. And he chose Hananiah, who he knew to be more faithful and God fearing than most everyone else. Nehemiah had opportunity to claim power for himself, but he chooses instead to appoint the right people for the task ahead. He appoints those who are trusted and those who, like himself, would fear God rather than man. He tasks them with protecting the city and gives them advice on how to do it. You know, open the gates at the hottest time of the day when attacks less favourable. You know, who wants to go and attack a city when it's the middle of the middle of the day when it's baking hot? Um, and he gets them to establish guards throughout the city at all times. You know, let us too be wise and on guard. Let's be particularly on guard when it's most dangerous for us. At times of temptation, when things are hard, keep the gates closed at you know all the time the enemy has an advantage. You know, retreat into the arms of Lord, of the Lord and go into safety when things are most dangerous for us. And let us relax when things are most dangerous for our enemy. 
then we can open the gates. That when think, you know, things are most dangerous for our enemy when we walk in the ways that God calls us in the work that the Lord sets before us. Nehemiah encountered fear, but at no point did he permit fear to distract him from the most important task in hand, which was what God called him to. Uh, for Nehemiah, it was rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. Perhaps, uh, you know, as a, as a church, as, as the whole international church, uh, the universal church, the call is to go into all the world and create disciples of peoples of all nations, uh, make disciples of peoples of all nations. You know, that's our big call. Um, but God calls us to individual work as well. Um, and let's seek to be faithful to both of those calls. You know, fear isn't all bad. In fact, some, peer, some fear is empowering. Nehemiah chose one who feared the Lord to protect the people of the city. Jesus says this in Luke chapter 12. I say to you, my friends, don't fear those who kill the body and after that can do nothing more. But I will show you the one to fear. Fear him who has authority to throw people into hell after death. Yes, I say to you, this is the one to fear. Aren't five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten in God's sight. Indeed, the hairs of your head are all counted. Don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. There is a right reverential fear that should captivate our hearts, our eyes and our minds. That's the fear of God. The fear of a God who makes decisions on life and death and our eternal destinies. The very same who knows precisely how many hairs are upon your head. The same God who cares for you. In Romans, we're told that if we're believers, we can cry out to our Abba Father, God who loves and cares for his own. We balance a right fear of God with the fact that we are his children and he loves us. We balance the, the entirely correct reverential fear of God with the truth that we are his that we are his children and he loves us. Let's be those who get caught up and transfixed by him so that the fears of the world become as nothing to us and the worship and praise of God in all we do become our priority and our mission to see through until the end. Let's pray. Lord God, you are so marvellous, so wonderful, so mighty. And if, if we believe in you, if we trust in you as our Lord and Saviour, then we know you have a plan for our lives. It's clear from the word, from your, from the, your word, the Bible, that you have a plan for our lives. That you've called us uh, to be your very own. You've called us for a purpose. You call us to worship you. And to worship you, we have to have our eyes set upon you. We have to seek to walk with you, seek to know you. When we do get distracted onto other things, our worship can shift away from God, uh, to, away from the Lord and onto things that um, just aren't helpful. For us to truly fear you and to, to walk with you, we have to keep our eyes set upon you. So I pray, Lord, for us as a church, that you'd help us to walk closely with you, to keep our eyes on the work at hand, the things that you've called us to as a church and as individuals, and that you would equip us to keep going in those things, to keep walking in those things, Lord. Prepare BFC, Lord God, to, to be those who will stand firm when fear strikes because our right fear is found in you, not in the things of the world. Thank you, Lord, that, yeah, we can fear you and at the same time know your care and your love. Help us, I pray, to walk in the goodness of that. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, guys. Thank you for that message, Craig, and thank you, everybody, for joining us. Now, we do do this service live over Zoom with the whole church, which enables us to have contributions from our members, such as words and pictures and so forth, um, followed by a coffee and catch-up session, again, over Zoom. If you'd like to join us for either of those things, please email us at contact at billingshurstfamily.church. 
um, and we'd love to have you along. We are also shortly going to be running some courses which you might be interested in. We've got a parenting course. Um, we'll also be having an alpha course for people who are interested in discovering more about our faith and who maybe have all sorts of questions about life and such forth. Um, we also run uh, CAP courses, which are um, courses aimed at um, helping you with your finances. They are run by Christians Against Poverty. They're very good. I've done one. They're excellent. Um, if you'd be interested in any of the above courses, again, please email us at contact at billingshurstfamily.church. But for now, that's everything from me. Hope to see you soon. Bye.